This public service announcement about hybrid vehicles, are they worth it, is one of the Fox Valley video series on living sustainably. It is brought to you by ECOS of the Fox Valley, the Town of Menasha Sustainability Committee, and SCA Tissue. This is a hybrid Formula One car. This is a hybrid luxury car. My name is Terry Hayes, and I own a hybrid. People often ask me, what is the payback on those hybrids? And I asked myself the same question before I, I bought my first one, which I've had since 2005. I did my own research, and because I'm a bit of a data geek, I actually did quite a lot of uh, data analysis on it, and I wanted to share some of those results with you today. So I'm excited to share what I found, and if you can stay with me for about the next 18 minutes, I will share my results. Thanks. There are two ways for a potential buyer to value a vehicle they're about to purchase. One is to use the consumer reports type values that tend to be more objective. The other is to use the feelings type values that are obviously more subjective. These are the ones that marketing typically, typically goes after. The consumer reports values might be cost to buy or ongoing cost to own or things like reliability, performance, ergonomics, space, or safety. The marketing type values are enjoyment when you use it, pride of ownership, environmental impact, which is really the cost to society, the statement it makes to others, which is really an example you're setting for others, or voting with your dollars, which is about pushing commerce in the right direction. Buyers obviously tend to use both those types of values. They will use the objective dollars and cents type stuff, but they also are interested in some of those subjective qualities but what they really like in a car. And a particularly, I think one that is often uh, important to buyers is that pride of ownership. So I wanna address both these issues, both the, uh, the cost and the value aspects, as well as the things like the pride of ownership. And as an example, when I bought my car back in 2005, the, uh, a lot of the people when I'm sitting there at the gas station filling up gave me a lot of positive feedback because that was right about the time when all the gas prices started really going up. And as gas prices went up, um, I was feeling pretty uh, proud and pretty uh, good about the decision I'd made to buy a hybrid. For the purposes of this presentation, I will focus mostly on the cost measures found in the first set of values. <clears throat> there are three key points that I would like to share with you today. The first, gas cars do waste a lot of fuel. Second, how hybrids will waste less fuel. And finally, I will demonstrate why hybrids are worth it by most measures. We have seen for all for ourselves how gas prices just keep going up. But do you remember just how much? Gas prices on this graph on the are on the vertical axis. It is eight years across the horizontal axis from 2004 to 2012. In a four year period, they have gone up more than $2 from under $2 to above $4. The dip you see here halfway across at the end of 2008 was when the economy tanked. So just in case you think that first time period was a fluke, after dropping because of a lack of demand, it proceeded to go back up again by more than $2 in another four year period. Do you see a trend here? Normal gasoline cars waste a lot of gas. Let me explain why. Let's look at a scenario of an average commute to work. Let's take the average gasoline car cruising down a level road at a steady speed of 60 miles per hour with no wind. Do you know that this average car only needs about 15 horsepower to just cruise along at a steady speed of 60 miles an hour? Yet the average car actually has a 150 horsepower engine in it. Seems a little oversized. But you say I need that extra power to accelerate. This is true. But most of the time, you're stuck in the flow of traffic or you're not in a panic. So even when you accelerate, you still only use about 40 horsepower, even for a fairly brisk acceleration. But you say, what if I need to pass or make some emergency maneuver where I need to floor it? I need every bit of that 150 horsepower. And this is also true. But even fairly underpowered cars can get up to speed in 10 seconds or less. So how many times have you actually completely floored it in the last month? I kept track for myself, and it was maybe once or twice. 
So you only need all that power on very rare occasions, maybe 20 seconds a month. That's less than 1% of the time. And then, of course, for all the times you're accelerating, you will be slowing down, too. And you don't need any horsepower from the engine then. And let's not forget about idling at stop signs. That 150 horsepower is of no use then either. So we carry around a three or four times bigger engine than we need 99% of the time, and just, just so we have it for that 1% of the time, we might need it. And some people will even pay extra to choose that bigger engine in the same model car. Why do people do that? Perhaps payback does not have to be measured completely in dollars. Perhaps some of those other subjective qualities weigh in pretty high as well. So can I have my cake and eat it too? What if I could have both power and good mileage? Hybrids do this. With, with most hybrids, you still have a gas tank that feeds a gas engine. It still helps drive the car. But it also has batteries that feed an electric motor. And here's the tricky part. There's a special drivetrain that automatically senses how much power you need and decides which of the motors should kick in, kick in and if, and, or if both should kick in. So you only use all the power when you need it. The rest of the extra time, the rest of the time, the extra power is shut down, not burning energy. If you were to graph out the power that a typical gas engine has, like the dashed red line on this graph, you would see at lower engine speeds, like when you first touch the gas pedal, that it does not have as much torque. This would be towards the left half of this graph. Engine torque is that feeling of push you forward acceleration that bigger engines make lots of. So as you spin the engine faster, it makes more torque, and away you go, like on the right half of the graph. An electric motor, on the other hand, has a huge amount of torque from the second it begins to spin, as shown here by the green dotted line. In fact, zero speed is its maximum torque. Electric motors are actually better at doing standing start burnouts than gas engines. So when you marry these two together, they make the perfect complementary pair. The shape of the resulting solid blue torque curve is one normally found in tractors. Gas engine designers would kill for that big and flat of a curve. The more area under the curve, the more the drivetrain feels powerful to the average driver. So higher mileage hybrids can size their gas engines to half that of a normal car's and then make up the difference with the electric motor. So now let's look, let's look at our average commuter in their hybrid. They have a smaller gas engine, so it gets much better miles per gallon just cruising along. When they do need to accelerate, it kicks in the electric motor and uses both gas and electric combined. Remember the tractor-like power that makes? They accelerate like a much bigger, more powerful all-gas car. Ah, but what about all that battery juice you just used? How does that get recharged? During braking, instead of just using normal brakes, it switches the motor into a generator and uses all that momentum you gained to recharge the batteries. You still have normal brakes for emergencies, but they are tasked much less than a normal car. I finally replaced my first set of brakes at 160,000 miles, and I'm a rather heavy-footed braker. And even if the braking was not enough to fully recharge the batteries, the drive system knows enough to tap just a little extra power from the gas engine, just while you're normally cruising along using that 15 horsepower's worth. It is all automatic, and you just drive it like any other car. And if you were all caught up on recharging the batteries, then when you stop at a stop sign, it will shut off the gas engine, so it does not burn any gas just sitting there doing nothing. I have to share with you my own experience when I first bought my hybrid, and the first few times when I pulled up next to a, a stoplight, uh, and I was the first one in line, it was rather unnerving when the gas engine completely shuts off, and the car really just goes silent. And you're sitting there wondering, my gosh, when the light turns green, am I going to be able to go, and are people going to be waiting on me because the car's going to hesitate? But what you have to remember is this electric motor, which has all that torque that I talked about, just takes off with instant acceleration the moment that you hit the gas pedal. And even as the engine, or even as the car is accelerating through the intersection, it actually will start the gas engine as well, and it'll kick both in, and the car will just take right off with that tractor-like power that I talked about. So people like to joke about how hybrids are gutless, but actually the, kinda, the secret that us hybrid owners have is they're really not gutless at all they actually have a surprising amount of power and acceleration. 
And I'll be honest with you, I'm a bit of a lead-footed uh, driver myself. So even uh, at a lot of these intersections, if I'm first in line, I end up out accelerating a lot of the other cars that take off when the light turns green. So that's an example for you of how uh, you can have different qualities besides just the actual financial payback come into play. And for me, I enjoy my hybrid as well because it actually does have good pep and good acceleration. I can pass easily, I can move away from intersections uh, with complete confidence. But let's get back to the payback question. So here we go. Let's assume that for most people, the payback question is really asking, is it cheaper to own than a regular car? How are we going to calculate that? What if I add up all the costs of ownership over the whole life of a car? If I do that for a normal car and then for a hybrid, then I can compare that total cost to each other. So everything I'm going to show you is either based on the manufacturer specs, like purchase costs and miles per gallon, or a neutral website that tallies things like insurance and maintenance costs of all makes of cars. So let's start with a hybrid. I will use one of the most popular hybrid models. For all the cars considered here, I start out assuming that they will last for 150,000 miles. I tried to research actual lifetime in miles by model, but could not quantify this. You can make your own judgments about how long you think different cars will last. So if I buy a car for $22,000 and drive it for 150,000 miles, then that will cost me 15 cents per mile. Maintenance costs were not significantly different on hybrids, despite many people's fears. The facts say that, in, that in, for the entire life of the car, you might actually only pay between zero and hundred dollars more in maintenance for this hybrid technology. The first thing people often ask is, well, what if I need to replace the batteries? First, let me say that it is less likely that you have, than you having to place the, the entire engine in a normal car. They're typically warranted for 100,000 plus miles, but more importantly, the typical life is still being added up because they are finding them going 300 plus thousand miles and counting. So we have not yet gotten a good statistical read because many people do not drive the car longer than that for other reasons. For instance, taxis in New York are required to be retired from service after 350,000 miles, and their hybrid taxis' batteries were still good even after that time. So let's remember this 34 cents per mile, the cost of ownership, and see how that compares to other vehicles. To give you a sense of scale, I show different classes of vehicles. At the top of the list is a used car scenario. It is actually based on a real-life acquaintance of mine who truly was trying to minimize his total cost of ownership. So obviously, if the only thing that matters is payback, buy the right used car. All the rest, however, were new. The second one down, the hybrid best value, is not the largest selling one, but a different, less expensive model. The regular gas subcompacts I'll refer to as the Econo cars. You know them as some of the cheapest to buy with some of the best mileage in their class among all gas cars. The popular hybrid, next one on the list, is the one that I have been using for this comparison case at 34 cents per mile and will continue to use. But still, let's dive in deeper. You can see that the best hybrid value car out there is cheaper than Econo cars already. So that question's answered. But it would appear that the Econo cars have just a slight advantage over the popular hybrid. So let's take a look at how this popular hybrid compares to the Econos on a more apples to apples basis. As we stack up all those costs, you can see the 34 cents per mile hybrid and the 33 cents per mile Econo car on the right. At first, it seems that other, these other hybrids are not worth it. The height of the Econo stacks up shorter than the hybrid. Shorter is better in this graph, as in less dollars per mile. But don't forget about how gas prices keep going up. You can pay now in upfront purchase price, such as the lower left, or pay later in gas bills, such as the upper right. Let's look at this a little closer. Let's look at some other comparisons where hybrids are actually financially cheaper to own. Most people agree that the cheapest Econo cars probably will not last as many miles as the leading hybrids. If they outlast the Econo's useful life by just another 7,000 miles, the hybrids really are worth it. 
For example, a hybrid lasts at least 157,000 miles, while the Econo dies at 150,000 miles. Remember, your purchase price is fixed, so the more miles you drive, drive it, the less it costs per mile. Remember those 350,000 mile taxis? They were this popular hybrid example I'm using in this comparison. When is the last time you heard of an Econo car going 350,000 miles? Another example is remember when how I said that hybrids had more power than people thought? If you actually compare them to all gas cars with equal power, then the hybrid is also cheaper to own as well. Another example is the price of gas, which has a high probability of going up during the life of a hybrid that you might buy today. If gas goes above $4.50 per gallon, then even against the more underpowered Econo cars, hybrids will still be cheaper. So remember, don't just buy your car based on today's gas prices. Buy it based on what you actually pay over the life of the car. And lastly, if we included the cost to society of the greenhouse gases, the added dollar cost makes the hybrid cheaper. We actually dollarize the impact of greenhouse gases. And it is true this is not directly out of your personal pocketbook. So this comparison is simply showing that if you value the impact on the environment, then adding this in may become worth it to you. So this number four is an example of bringing in other values for your decision, like I talked about earlier. So what do you think? Where do you think gas prices will be in the next four years? So what does all this mean to you? We've proven that hybrids do pay back, even today, when compared apples to apples. We've proven that you do not really have to pay extra to be green today. And we want to make sure to remind you that hybrids do protect yourself, can protect you from future rising gas prices. So hybrids do pay back, and I think we, we, I've hopefully demonstrated that for you today, and also hopefully demonstrated that they may also have more than just financial payback, but there may actually have some other qualities about them that you may find uh, just as valuable to you, including things like pride of ownership. Don't underestimate that. So I ask to, for you to please open your mind when you're considering your next purchase. And I thank you for taking the time to listen to my program. <clears throat> this public service announcement is one of the Fox Valley video series on living sustainably that is brought to you by Ecos of the Fox Valley, the town of Menasha, and SCA. For more information, go to www.ecos-foxvalley.